how can you become a saint according to the King James Bible? Not according to the traditions of men, according to the King James Bible. Let's look at Matthew chapter 15. We're going to start out and uh, I'm going to show you the danger of when men start to overthrow Scripture with their traditions. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9 says here, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and on earth not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God by, of none effect by your tradition. Let me just stop right there for a minute. If you don't understand what's going on here, basically uh, this thing, another passage that says it is Corban, you know, C-O-R-B-A-N, I think is how it's, it's said. But... Um, Basically, what these guys were doing back there in the first century is they were going and they were taking their parents' money and they were saying, I'll take your money and I'll give it to the priest in the temple. Okay, and then they'll hold on to that money and I'll say it's a gift to the temple. Okay, and then when your parents get older and they, they can't take care of themselves and things, then you go to the state or whatever and you say, my parents don't have any money. They're poor. They're broke. You know, please take care of them. And then when the parents die, then the son goes back to the priest and he says, okay, they're gone. And the priest says, okay, here's your money back with a little bit taken out for me, a little fee. See, it was a gift. Oh, it's just a gift to the temple. I just, I gave, you know, my parents money. There was a gift to the temple. You know, kind of like what goes on today with a lot of the 501c3 giving of offerings and writing it off on your taxes and all these little deals that you can do to, get some of that money back, you know. Very interesting. But Jesus Christ is condemning it here in this passage. Verse 7, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Okay? Jesus was saying, when you worship Him, and it's not according to the Word of God, it's not found here in Scripture, then that worship is in vain. You say, but, you know, our Holy Church has established this. That it doesn't matter. If it's not in Scripture, then you have no business doing it. Plain and simple. Okay? And that's what we're going to look at today. There is a word called saint. And there is a certain system that abuses this word saint. All right. You say, oh, this is another anti-Catholic video. This is a video that exposes the truth. And if there is an organization, the Roman Catholics, I'll, put, I'll quit playing politically correct here. The Roman Catholic system elevates tradition above Scripture. Scripture is only there when it works out with their traditions. Okay, when scripture contradicts divine tradition, you throw out the scripture and you exalt the divine tradition because you see, according to Catholicism, with their amillennial belief system, that the whole Bible basically was completed back there as far as all the events happened in it back in the first century. And so now we're in the millennial kingdom, and who is Christ reigning on the earth? Well, that's the Pope, of course. See, and the only thing that really happens in the future is, you know, the Jesus Christ comes back to judge and things like that. There is no time of Jacob's trouble. There, well, there's no rapture. There's no time of Jacob's trouble. And there's no millennial kingdom, according to Catholicism. And why? Well, they're trying to steal the kingdom and the glory from Jesus Christ. They're trying to, but they're not going to be successful because their time's just about up. And we're going to see that in this study later on. But one of the things that they do... Catholicism is ancient Babylonian, the mystery satanic system that went through Egypt and Greek and, and all these different pagan peoples. 
And one of the things that they had in that system, they had smaller, lesser gods. Okay, you had Mount Olympus, where you had Zeus as the big god, and then you had all the other little small gods underneath him. You have the Romans, you know, they have a, a supreme deity, and then all the smaller little gods underneath them. Well, now, how does Catholicism, the ancient pagan system, how do they bring that into professing Christianity? Well, simple. You don't have smaller gods because then you could, you know, people could figure out that you're actually a satanic cult. What you have is you say that they are saints, patron saints, you know. And don't worry because if you do a good enough job with your works, you too might become a saint someday, according to Catholicism. I'm going to show you here catholicdoors.com. How do you become a Catholic saint? Okay, it says here, uh, question, how does one become a saint? Answer, contrary to the common belief that there are three steps to becoming a saint, the Catholic Church teaches that there are four steps uh, to becoming a saint. I'm just going to read it as it should. They, they have the becoming a saint there on their thing, but I'm just going to read it to becoming a saint. Many teachers of this omit the first step. Okay, before a person can be considered for sainthood, he, she must have been dead for at least five years. Pope John Paul II waived this requirement in Mother Teresa's case. Okay, now that's going to be key throughout this study. They have to have been dead at least five years, or at least they have been dead. All right, in other words, you can't even be considered for sainthood until you are dead. So there's be no such thing as a living saint according to official Catholic doctrine. Step number one. When the subject arises that a person should be considered for sainthood, a bishop is placed in charge of the initial investigation of the person's life. It is determined that the candidate is deemed worthy of further consideration. The Vatican grants a nihil obstat. That is a, this is a Latin phrase that means nothing hinders. Henceforth, the candidate is called a servant of God. Second step. The church official, a postulator who coordinates the process and serves as an advocate, must prove that the candidate lived heroic virtues. This is achieved through the collection of documents and testimonies that are collected and presented to the congregation for the cause, causes of saints in Rome. When a candidate is approved, he, she earns the title of venerable. Step number three. To be beatified and recognized as blessed, one miracle acquired through the candidate's intercession is required in addition to recognition of heroic virtue or martyrdom in the case of a martyr. Um, fourth step, fourth and final step here. Canonization requires a second miracle after beatification, though a pope may waive these requirements. A miracle is not required prior to a martyr's beatification, but one is required before his or her canonization. Once the second miracle has been received through the candidate's intercession, the Pope declares the person a saint. Okay, and of course, what was the most recent uh, canonization? Well, you had the two dopes, uh, excuse me, popes. Um, you had the two the two popes, Pope John Paul II and Pope, what was it, uh, Paul VI or something like that? Um, just a few, right back here in April, you had that thing happen uh, where these two guys were, became official saints, you know, in the Catholic Church. The Catholic system. All right. Now, I want you to notice two things with those qualifications we just read there. Number one, sainthood is determined by works. Where did it say anything in there about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It didn't. You're a member of the Mystery Babylon there, the Catholic Church, you know. Well, then you're obviously a Christian, I guess. Sure. Yeah, right. You know, I guess uh, Adolf Hitler being a uh, baptized Roman Catholic and, and Heinrich Himmler being a baptized Roman Catholic and Al Capone and, and um, Richard Kuklinski, the serial killer, and all these different, you know, baptized Roman Catholics, they're all Christians, mind you. They just aren't going to become saints, you know, because they probably didn't kill enough Christians, you know, Bible-believing Christians, that is. Number two, and this is the most important one, which I mentioned earlier, no living Catholic can be considered a saint, according to their official standards. Now, they might try to get around that by saying, well, you know, in the first century, um, you know, some people called each other saints, but it's not the same as the saint thing, and the blah, blah, blah. We're going to see about that in this study. All right. 
And before we continue, um, a couple years back, quite a few years ago, actually, in my my from my documentary uh, film that I did uh, from NIV to KJV, I did a collation work. Um, this thing here, five thousand documented word perversions in the NIV TNIV. Okay, and it's interesting because after I came out with this, the NIV people came out with their 2011 NIV, thereby rendering the old NIV and the, you know, the old NIV and the new TNIV, you know, we don't use those anymore. We're not like that anymore, you know. So interesting that they would time that right after I came out with this study. But um, one of the words that is attacked in the NIV and especially in the TNIV is the word saint and saints. I mean, boy, those sure are archaic words, aren't they? You know, I mean, who can understand the word saint? That's passed out of common everyday usage. Why would they take the name saint out? And we're going to see why in this study. I'm going to show you the reason that these new versions take the word saint out and question the word saint is because they don't want people knowing that just everyday average Christians that are born again are saints, according to Scripture. And in fact, there were Old Testament people that are saints. And in fact, in the time of Jacob's trouble, there are saints. It's a generic term for anybody who's saved. Saints. And the saints are capable of sinning. You say, what? A saint is capable of sinning? Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm going to show you that in the study today. According to the Bible, not according to tradition. See, I mean, you know, think about the absurdity of Roman Catholicism for a minute. How would you think if I just said, ladies and gentlemen, I know the Bible is a very good book. It's very venerable, and we should certainly venerate it and, and, and appreciate sacred scripture. But I'm going to tell you today my thoughts and my feelings. And yes, they will contradict sacred scripture, but you should listen to me anyhow. How many people would respect me? Well, if you have any sense, it, it should be none. <laughs> okay. But why is it wrong for me, but okay for the Pope? You know, this organization that rapes and molests children into the millions paid out billions of dollars over the last I don't even know how many years 10 20 years billions and billions of dollars being paid out all the time to keep children quiet that have been raped and these are the guys that are saying you can trust us with tradition that overthrows scripture and you want me to listen to that and submit to that and I get these Catholics, you know, writing comments and stuff in my videos. Oh, I do hope that you'll get saved and become a Catholic. Um, you could put a gun to my head and say, become a Catholic or die. And I would say, pull the trigger. All right. I'm not going to convert to Catholicism, even if it means my life. But uh, here we have the NIV and the TNIV, the old one, the 1984 NIV and the 2005 TNIV, but uh, that's not accurate anymore. So I actually had my wife help me on this one because I was busy writing the sermon notes for this thing and doing a lot of the research. And so she did a collation for me of, there are five references to the word saint, you know, singular, five references to the word saint, 95 references to saints in the plural. So what she did is she did a collation of three of the more popular new versions, you know, that come from the Vatican. You have the 2011 NIV right here. The extremely stupid version, ESV. And then you have the most retarded of all new versions, the message. Okay, this is the dumbest thing that you'd ever want to read. It's absurd. But these three right here, she did a collation. And so I'm going to be periodically talking about that throughout this study. And you say, well, did they take words out? Well, I'll give you the numbers here at the beginning. The 2011 NIV, right here, removed the word saint 100% of the time. Five out of five times, they take, they change the word saint. They put it, they change it to um, uh, Holy One, Holy One, God's People, Him. They changed it. Why? Is saint archaic? No. Why take out the word saint? You say, well, how'd they do with the word saints? 
um, that would be 95 out of 95. 100% of the time, the, the newest NIV removed the word saint or saints. So, you know, they said, well, you know, the original NIV was very much more conservative than the TNIV. Well, it went a little bit too liberal. It was kind of gender inclusive, feminist, you know. So don't worry, we revised it and brought out the 2011 NIV. And you can trust this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, you can trust it all right. It retained the TNIV uh, perversion of taking the word saints completely out. Saint and saints. Interesting. What about the ESV? Well, they have left in one reference to the word saint. So it's four out of five times they took the word saints out or saint out. And as far as the word saints in the plural, they removed 18 of the 95 references to saints. So 18 times they took the word saints out and four times they took the word saint out. Why? It's not archaic. Why would you stand up for a new version like that? How about the message? Oh boy. Well, they took the word saint out five out of five times. The word saints has been re removed 87 out of 95 times. So this thing actually has saints in it a few times. Um, what do you have there? Uh, eight times. It says saints. Whereas the newest NIV takes the word saints out completely. It's kind of weird. But uh, I'll be referring to this list here as we go through this. We're actually going to look up all of the references. You say 100 references in Scripture? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you see, that's called being a Bible believer. Looking up a lot of Scripture. Basing our truth, our facts upon the Word of God. Not on my beliefs. See, you know, there again. How can you judge me? I have a standard, and the standard doesn't change. The standard is the King James Bible. And if you're going to judge me, you can have the standard too. You can go out to a store, you can get one of these things, and then you can have the standard that judges me. How can you judge a Catholic? Well, you say you can judge a Catholic with the Bible as well, as, and, and you know with divine tradition. You just get the catechism and the Bible. Yeah, but what if the Pope comes out and overthrows the divine tradition? Comes out and gives a new ex cathedra, you know, statement. It's a problem. But let's look at the law of first mention. Usually your word will be defined in the first time it appears. Let's look at that. Psalm 106. Psalm 106. First time that the word saint appears in your King James Bible. So 106, verse 6 through 16, we'll read these. Okay, it says here, We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt, they remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the Red Sea, even at the Red Sea. Or even, provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths as through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. All right, let me just stop for a minute here. Are these the actions of dead people or people that are alive on the earth that we've read so far? Uh, I'd say that they're alive on the earth, right? Look at verse 16. They envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord. So what you have there now, understand, is you have Moses in the camp there and they're praying to their patron saint Aaron. Uh, in the Old Testament. No, Aaron was there and he was living at the time on the earth. Hmm. So a saint 
then Aaron is called the saint of the Lord. I'd say it's a pretty good title, but it's a title that was not given to a man that was dead living in heaven and overseeing the prayers of the Catholic people. He was alive on the earth. So the very first time that the word saint appears, it's a reference to a man living on the earth. Kind of makes a problem for that Catholic tradition, doesn't it? Daniel chapter 8. We're going to go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Okay, now we're not going to read the whole passage there for sake of time, but you go down through it, he's seeing a prophecy of the future. Okay, but he's seeing a vision. Jump down to verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, uh, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And by the way, you'll see this thing all throughout there where Daniel, Daniel is having, he's actually talking to angels and he always says it's a man. He doesn't say it's a winged, sexless being. That's another thing we're going to be talking about in the future here, this thing of the Catholic depiction of angels and cherub. Uh, it's very disturbing. But you see there, he is seeing a vision and he speaks to saints. So were these saints living on the earth or were they in heaven? You say, we got you now. We got you now, you Protestant, you know, you stupid Protestant and things. We, we Catholics have you now because those, Catholic, those saints were obviously in heaven. Yeah. But let me ask you a question. A saint that is living on the earth, do they cease to become a, or do they cease to be a saint when they die and go to heaven? No. If you're a saint on the earth, you die, you're still a saint in heaven. So, no, that doesn't prove that there's a special order that's of demigods underneath God the Father that answer the prayers of God's people. It doesn't prove that. Okay, you can have people that are saved that have gone on to heaven and they speak to people on the earth. That does not mean that they are patron saints, the way that the Catholic system depicts them. Okay, next we're going to go to Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to see that throughout this study. You're going to see that there are times when there are references to saints on the earth, and there are times when it does refer to saints in heaven. Philippians 4, verse 21 through 23. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus, the brethren with our, which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Um, sounds to me like they're living on the earth, those saints. And uh, Paul is referring to them as just average Christians, just regular old Christians. Those of Caesar's household. That's what they were. A New Testament Christian is a saint. A saint of God. You do not have to go through some special um, thing and what we read about earlier there. You don't have to go through all that nonsense. That's ridiculous. You have to get saved. You have to be born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not by drinking it, but by having the blood wash your sins away. But let's continue. What about the word saints in the plural? 
Deuteronomy 33. Let's get started. We're going to go through the Bible and we're going to look at every reference. Deuteronomy 33. It's one thing that I try to always do. If you know anything at all about this ministry, I try to give the Word of God the floor. I try not to run my mouth a whole lot. Sometimes I do, but um, you're not going to see this ministry be about reading one or two verses of Scripture when I do a Bible study anyhow. If I'm doing an announcement or something like that, yeah, I might not read much Scripture. But uh, if I'm doing an actual Bible study, my regular Sunday message, there's going to be a lot of Scripture in it. Because that's the way we do it. Deuteronomy 33, verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy words. Okay, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. So interestingly that you see the two there. First of all, in verse 2, he's coming with ten thousands of saints. That's interesting. But number two, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Right? I believe that that is a reference to the saved Jews that were there in that congregation there under Moses. So you see, saints is a reference to saved in heaven, that are glorified, that are coming back with the Lord at His second coming, and you also see saved that are here on the earth. Saints can refer to either one. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Let's go there next. First Samuel 2. Okay, 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 9. It says here, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. All right. Again, you can see this is a reference to living people, saved people in the Old Testament. They weren't called Christians. Okay, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So these people in the past were not Christians. They are Old Testament saints living on the earth, which debunks the thing of a saint, an official saint in Catholicism, has to have been dead for at least five years unless, you know, like Mother Teresa. And Mother Teresa was not a saved woman. She was a very wicked, lost woman. Okay, there's quotes of her talking about the New World Order and things like that. I mean, she was not a saved woman. Sorry if you're a Catholic and you worship the woman. But let's next go to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 41. Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength, let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. People that are alive on the earth, obviously. 
Next, go to Job. Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5 and verse 1. It says here, Call now, is there be any, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? Oh boy, proof text. A proof text for patron saints. Which of the saints are you going to turn to? Wow, which one? Which one? Well, scripture with scripture. Let's see what this actually means. Job chapter 15. Job chapter 15, verses 14 through 16. What is man that he should be clean, and he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous? Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? He putteth no trust in his saints? You see, what you have here is you have a contrast between saved people in the Old Testament, the saints, and those that are lost there. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? Lost man. That's what's going on there. So God doesn't trust his saints in terms of being perfect and sinless and things like that. You know. So when Job chapter 5 is talking about you know, turning to saints, it's just simply saying turning to those that are saved. For help, but you, which is good. You're supposed to talk to other Christians and things like that and fellowship with other brethren and, and judge each other and things like that. That's, that's good. You know, judge each other according to the Word of God. That's fine. But to put up a saint on some kind of a special pedestal where they are holy and wonderful and you, you know, can pray to them and things like that, no, that doesn't work. You're not going to see that teaching in the King James Bible. You're not going to see this thing of saints being some kind of a lesser level of gods that can answer your prayers. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Next, go to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verse 1 through 3. It says here, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, hmm, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. To, to the saints that are in the earth? I thought Catholic... Catholicism there, the Catholic um, tradition, said that a saint, for somebody to become a saint, they have to be dead for at least five years. Doesn't work too good, does it? Psalm 30. Go here to Psalm 30 next. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Can saints sing in heaven? Mm -hmm. I imagine we'll do plenty of that. Can they sing on earth? Yeah, you can do that too. Psalm 31, verse 23. O love the Lord, all ye His saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. So there you, again you see I mean, why does God have to reward saints that are in heaven that are just intercessors, you know, and all this other stuff? It doesn't make any sense. It's talking to saints as a reference to saved people on the earth. Next, we're going to go to Psalm 34, verses 9 through 11. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Again, if these people are lesser gods or something up there in heaven that were officially went through all the four steps of canonization to become an official saint, why do they need to fear God? You know, why do they need to, to uh, you know, 
There's no want to them that fear him. What do you want for if you're living in heaven? Now it's a reference to saved people on the earth. Next, we're going to go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, verse 27 through 32. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Okay. Again, you're talking, you can see the difference there. Saints on the earth and the wicked hate the righteous and they want to slay him, which is kind of interesting. You know, the wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. Kind of like a lot of the Catholics do with me. You know, they watch me and they say, I hate that guy. I'd like to, man, I just wish we'd get that guy off of there. Mm -hmm. Yep. And of course, Catholics have persecuted real Bible-believing Christians now for centuries. So, no big surprise. Psalm 50. Psalm 50, verses 3 through 5. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Okay, so here you have a prophecy of Christ's second coming. And the saints are being gathered to him. They're not up there ruling and reigning with him in the sense of patron saints like the Catholic Church teaches. Now there will be Christians that are going to be in heaven, there will be Old Testament saints that are going to be in heaven during the time of Jacob's trouble. Sure, that's there. But again, it's not this system that Catholicism has set up. And, you know, before I go on anymore, let me just show you here. Um, I have here a whole list, AmericanCatholic.org, all of the patron saints of Catholicism. It's just absurd, you know. Um, and you can even get it, you know, a patron saint of the day, you know, on, as an uh, iPhone app. Yeah. Um, saints by cause. Certain Catholic saints are associated with certain life situations. These patron saints intercede to God for us. We can take our special needs to them and know that they listen to our prayers and pray to God with us. Click, click, click here to receive saint of the day in your email. You know. And then you have for accountants, you have St. Matthew, actors, St. Genesius, addicts, St. Maximilian, Mary Colby, advertising, St. Bernardine of Siena, African-Americans, you got three saints for you. Hey, congratulations. AIDS patients, St. Peregrine, Lazio, Laziosi, air travelers, alcoholics, altar services, and it goes down through. Some of the stuff is so funny. Uh, you have one for grocers, one for gypsies, one for hairdressers. If you want a happy death, you got one there. Headaches, St. Teresa of Avilia, uh, heart patients, homeless, horses. You got one for horses, you know, St. Martin of Tours. Um, jewelers, you know, St. Elig Eligius. Uh, foundry workers, florists. Hey, you got three there too. Fishermen, you got two. Firefighters, drug addiction, earaches, earthquakes. You know, all these good uh, lowercase g gods, you know, to... Keep you going. Hey, comedians. There's a patron saint for comedians. Isn't that just wonderful? You know, butchers, cab drivers, uh, bodily ills, blind blacksmiths. You know, it goes down through here, all this thing. It's just insane. Uh, students, surgeons, servants, shepherds, um, radio, radiologists, uh, prisoners. That's so important there. Pregnant women. They got four you know, patron saints for pregnant women, you know, wine trade and uh, police officers, politicians, you know, St. Thomas More for the politicians, you know, you can pray to him. Um, obstetricians, orators, motorists, musicians, mystics, 
you know, St. John of the Cross, you know, if you're, if you're a mystic and you need prayer, real good, solid prayer, pray to St. John of the Cross. That's important, you know. And each country has its own patron saints too, you know, there you got New Zealand and, and uh, Paraguay and all that stuff. Ridiculous. Absolutely absurd. You know, and I mean, again, this stuff has no comparison at all to Scripture. None. But we'll continue here. Um, Psalm 52, verse 9. I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name, for it is good before thy saints. All right. Psalm 79, verses 1 and 2. 79, verse 1 and 2. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance, thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Hmm. So you have saints being killed and, uh, you know, their flesh being given to the beasts. Well, that would kind of precede death, wouldn't it? You know. Kind of hard to be dead for five years and be canonized as a saint and then be, you know, die and have your flesh given to the beast. Problem. Psalm 85. Psalm 85, verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Huh? Huh? He speaks to peace to his saints and let them not turn again to folly. Doesn't sound like these uh, patron saints over here would turn again to folly. After all, they're gods. You can pray to them. See how scripture contradicts tradition? That's because tradition is from men and is filled with lies. This book here comes from God and is filled with truth. Very interesting. Psalm 89, verse 5 through 7. It says here, In the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Uh, for, who is in the heaven, for who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Okay, when you have the assembly of the saints coming together, the church, okay, and that doesn't mean a building, it's just when the assembly of the saints comes together, that is the church, the people, not the building. But when you have them come together, it should be with reverence and godly fear. That's why there's so many rules against women speaking out and, and just disorder and things like that in 1 Corinthians 14. You see that there. But again, it's the assembly of the saints on the earth. Okay. Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He, preserve the, he preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Again, how do you deliver saints that are up in heaven, patron saints up there? How do you deliver them out of the hands of the wicked? They're in heaven. No, it's talking about people on the earth. Psalm 116, verse 15. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the canonization of his saints. No, it's the... Uh, death of his saints but i thought you had to be dead for five years before you could come you know become an official saint so how can it be precious that you die you know as a saint in god's sight because saints are living saved people you know, I've seen Catholics and they say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be a saint and stay? Well, it would be if you would just leave Catholicism and actually get saved. You say, uh, could you show me a real saint? Sure. Right there. You say, you're not a saint. You're not an official saint. That's preposterous. Well, I really hate to tell you that, but I am an official saint. 
Why? Because I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm a real Christian. I am a saint, according to Scripture. And I don't need to go through all kinds of processes, the four steps to become a saint. I don't need to do that. I'm a saint because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth me from all unrighteousness. My sins have been washed away because of my faith in what Christ did for, the, for me on the cross. Once and done. Not a perpetual ritualistic, satanic, cannibalistic system of drinking his blood and eating his flesh to stay saved. Okay, that is satanic. You can watch my video, The 13 Reasons Why Christians Must Reject the Mass, if you want more information on that. Okay, the system of Catholicism is satanic. Okay, you got to understand that. Very, very satanic, and it doesn't line up with Scripture. But we'll continue. Psalm 132. And I'm going through all these references because, sure enough, somebody's going to try to weasel out and say, you didn't cover them all or something. We're going to cover them all. Okay. Psalm 132, verse 9. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. Living saints, not dead. Psalm 132, verse 16. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Very similar to what we just read there in verse 9. Now let's go to Psalm 145, verse 10. Psalm 145, verses 10 through 12. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So what's the job of a saint? To witness to the lost. That's what I'm doing right now. I am making known to the sons of men, his mighty acts. You know what one of the Lord's mighty acts was? Saving a miserable, rotten, adrenaline junkie, pornography addict, a wicked, disgusting sinner. You say, who was that? Right there. I was very, very wicked. I deserve to go to hell. Back before I got saved, and I was a Christian too, by the way. I was raised in church buildings and stuff, and I was I was a professing Christian. I thought that I was saved for a very, very long time. I wasn't saved. You know, I'd read the Bible, I'd read the King James Bible, and I'd be like, it says here that the world's supposed to hate me. The world doesn't hate me. You know, I'm supposed to be the end of enemy of the world, you know, and I'm supposed to see persecution. I'm supposed to bear the reproach of Christ. I'm supposed to all this other stuff. This isn't happening in my life. You know, I was a popular guy by the time I was a senior in high school and things. And, and I got out and I was, you know, had fast cars and motorcycles and all the other stuff. And, and it was just like, my life doesn't line up with the book. And when I was 25 years old, I was sick and tired of the whole world thing. And I was just like, you know what? I want to be saved and I don't care what it's going to cost me. And at that point in time, I gave my life to Jesus Christ and my life changed for the first time ever. It was no longer an empty profession of faith. It was a true saving faith. God saved me. I didn't save myself by my little works or something else. God saved me and He changed my life. I became His bondservant. And now the longer I live, the more I do for the Lord, the more I see how Scripture lines up with what goes on in my life. And you'll see that too as a Christian. You'll see it. It's amazing. When you truly get born again, when you truly are saved by God, it's really, really something. But uh, let's continue here. Go to the next page. Psalm 148, verse 14. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, Praise ye the Lord. Okay? Again, you see, living saints. Psalm 149. Psalm 149, verses 1 through 9 says, Praise ye the Lord, sing unto the Lord a new song in his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. 
Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with a timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. I did a sermon here not too long ago, the thing about judging false prophets, judging and exposing false prophets. The two-edged sword that we have in our hands, this is actually better. Here I actually have a real two-edged sword, okay, right there. And that thing's sharp. I'm not going to try touching it or whatever with my hands. This is a sharp sword. This thing here, according to the book of Hebrews, is sharper than this. See, this thing here, I can whack you with it and stuff and send you to the hospital, and you can get better. And you can say, oh, he's just a nut. You know, that guy is crazy, and I'll go to jail and whatever for attacking you physically. But it's really not going to do much to you in terms of judgment or anything. This one here, when I whack you with this thing, or another Christian whacks you with it if you're lost, this thing here will cut into your soul. And this thing here, if you reject this double-edged sword, it's going to lead to your judgment someday and to your condemnation into the lake of fire. That's what people a lot of times don't understand. They say, oh, you're judging me, you're judging me. Yes, I'm judging you because I want you to get to the point where you realize that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved. You know, I had to be challenged back when I was a professing Christian. I had to be challenged by, uh, at the time it was Dr. Ken Hovind, into questioning, am I really truly a Christian? Am I really truly, is my life lining up here with this book? Am I really truly hating the things that God hates? Am I really truly judging the sins that are in my life? Am I really a disgusting sinner in God's sight? I had to be challenged. I had to be judged by a saint, a real one. And at that point in time, I started to question. I started to say, you know what? I don't think I'm saved. I don't think I'm a Christian. And so I judged myself then at that point, And I said, okay, I'm a sinner. I'm wicked. I deserve to go to hell and I'm scared to death. I don't want to go there. And that's when I came to the Lord as a sinner, and that's when I got saved. And that's what I'm trying to do to you. I'm not trying to get people mad and, and incite hatred for Catholicism, and let's, let's take Catholics out and torture them to death or something like that. I'm not trying to do that at all. Not at all. My greatest desire is to see Catholics get saved. Give up their phony religion, give up their phony religious practices, which I had to do back in my past. You know, the way I was raised was very much, there were many things that we did that was the same thing as Catholicism, even though it was quote-unquote independent Bible, you know. I had to give that stuff up to become a true Bible-believing Christian. And I thank the Lord that I have given that stuff up. I thank the Lord that I am now living a truly saved life. I truly am a saint today. Continuing. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 and 9, 6 through 9, excuse me. Proverbs 2, verse 6 through 9. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, and, he, and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. So I'm trying to teach people. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 15 through... Uh, we're just going to read down through here a couple verses. Daniel 7, verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four and four kings, are, excuse me, are four kings, which shall rise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, 
even forever and ever, speaking of the millennial kingdom, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom there fell, three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. We'll see that later on as we get into the book of Revelation. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay? Again, speaking of when we return with Jesus Christ, when Christians, saved born-again Christians, come down with Jesus Christ, we go out, we gather the nations to bring them to the judgment of the nations. Matthew chapter 25 is where you can read about that. And Jesus Christ judges them, and then we rule and reign with Christ on the earth for a thousand years, the millennial kingdom. We rule and reign as kings and priests. That's what's going on here. Uh, verse 23 Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise, or shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and she, he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Okay, so you see there a lot of people say, could you please prove a seven year you know, time of Jacob's trouble? Could you please prove that? Well, right there you have it. A time and times and a dividing of time. Three and a half. Time would be one, times would be two. Okay, plural of one there. And a dividing of time is a half. So it's three and a half. Okay, and Talks elsewhere about 42 months and things too. So it all lines up. All right. But um, continuing. Verse uh, 26 here. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom in an, is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. And as for me, Daniel, my cogitations uh, much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Okay, and it certainly is going to be a very disturbing time in the future. Okay, you turn to your next book there, Hosea. Hosea chapter 11, verse 12. Ephraim compasseth me about with lies in the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah yet ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. All right. Now, this is very interesting. I haven't been reading some of these things that these new versions say, but I'm just going to read here Hosea uh, chapter 11, verse 12. Um, uh, actually, I'm just going to have to look it up here quick. Make sure I get this thing right. But a lot of these new versions are written because they come from Catholicism. Catholicism teaches um, replacement theology. They teach that the Jews are no more. And so, you know, watch out for these people that say that they're in ministry and, uh, you know, they're actually teaching replacement theology. They're, they're basically closet Catholics. But these new versions, and, and Catholicism is also amillennial, so they're teaching that, you know, all the events of, uh, you know, revelation have already happened, as I said earlier. And they're trying to say that the kingdom is already come and that the Antichrist is, or excuse me, that uh, Jesus Christ ruling and reigning on earth is the Pope. So, you know, that's what's going on there. Um, we just got one more here, the modern NIV. I'm going to show you this thing of this replacement theology, this anti-Semitic uh, belief. Okay. Uh, 